Hello. Good morning. <laughs> How are you? Good. Thanks How's it going? You? Good. Thank you. So you in Australia, cool. Craig? I'm down in Oz. That's right. On the Gold Coast. That's so cool. Yeah. Uh, sure. So how's your day going anyway? You good? Great. Yeah. Are you? Yeah. yeah it's cool. It's good to see you. I haven't seen, I, you. Well, I haven't seen you since we finished, have I? I know. Yeah. And what a whirlwind. Like I can't yeah. believe we almost finished a year ago. I know. It's crazy, eh? Yeah, literally. Yeah, we were like almost preparing now for finals, weren't we? How are you feeling today? Excited about? Have you been on a podcast before? Yes, I've been on the Journey to Glow podcast. Okay, and, cool. Um, a, another one called Spirit Girls. Cool. So this is my third time. Ooh, Perfect. so you experienced cool. seasoned yeah. professional. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying. I bought a podcast microphone, and I was trying to set that up. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yeah, oh, those are funky. Those are cool. Way better than Garris. <laughs> <laughs> Mine are like piano flipping. Yeah, <laughs> they're definitely not for yeah. style. I can promise you that. <laughs> you look professional. <laughs> <laughs> oh, classic. Oh, that's a cool. Yeah, I'm not a technology kind of person. Everyone thinks <laughs> that, but I'm really not. <laughs> um, well, you wouldn't say you, that you, looking you at You're ahead of the pack already, like. <laughs> We, we spend lots of time trying to explain how to even find the app on people's phones before. So, <laughs> if, if you could, um, you, have you... all righty ho there. Good morning, Camille Nels. Thank morning. you so much for joining us today. How are you doing? I'm amazing. Thank you for having me. It's such a privilege. Yeah, I know. It's so good to see your face again. Like, haven't uh, <laughs> seen uh, that smile and i guess over a year now so it's uh, it's good to be connected yeah. <laughs> time flies it's yeah crazy. it does for sure so basically just a little bit of uh, background for those that are listening is uh, you and i we met uh, about two years ago now actually um oh my gosh, yeah. doing a we both did a natural chef uh, certification together and um yeah, it lasted over a year and that's how we met. And then ever since then, uh, we've stayed in touch, which is great. And it's been amazing to see the progress that you made and the business that you built. So it's really like an honor to be speaking to you today on the Ridiculously Human podcast. Thank you. Likewise, I'm really happy to be here. Really yeah. excited to share my awesome. story. Mm, that's so cool. That's so Thank cool. You. And I, I just remember like actually the first time that we met, um, we were in this like little classroom, like was our first kind of intro le lesson and, um, you like arrived and I was like, wow, like you're like so smiley, so like energetic. And the, and the, the thing that really stood out to me was your skin was glowing. And I was like, wow, this girl has amazing skin. <laughs> that was the first thing that I thought. Wow, right? oh my gosh, that makes me so happy. And, and, then, and then, like, I mean, I had no idea about, about your story at all. Um, and, uh, you know, you've, you've kindly sent me your book, which is an amazing read. Um, and just knowing, like, where you've come from and what you've gone through is, uh, is like, like, really inspirational. So... Um, you know, we really want to get into that. That's for sure. Thank you so much. That honestly means the world to me. Like mm -hmm. the glowing skin part. Oh. <laughs> I mean, it's sometimes hard for me to even believe it. Sometimes when people are like, "What do you do? Your skin's glowing." I'm like, "Oh my gosh!" Like if only you knew. You know the journey that I've been on. So yeah, yeah for you. sure. Yeah, no pleasure. No, literally, it was like radiating. I was like, "Whoa!" <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's classic. <laughs> so so. Your story is definitely rather unique, I must say, um, and maybe we can just jump right into there. You know, when you, when you were six years old, that was when you were first diagnosed with eczema. And yes. I was just wondering if like you recall, you know, when it happened and, and what it felt like at the time, was it like a sort of slow onset or, um, you know, how did it all begin basically? Um, well, my first memories were when I was around six years old. So I never like remember it all coming on, you know, like, oh my gosh, skin things happening to me. I just remember always having it. So the reason I say six is because that's the age my mum said. So she saw it come on. Um, I just remember it was just something I had to live with and my siblings didn't and nobody else did. So at the time I was just like, you know, I was young. 
this was just this thing my mum put creams on bandages it was just my thing Mm. didn't really think much of it until when I got to high school and started to realize wait a second why is it me that has this problem um yeah so at six years old it wasn't much to me at primary school again I just knew that I had a skin thing but it was high school mainly that yeah I started to really become insecure about it and really aware that I was different with this skin problem that Mm. was called eczema but I could never say the word Um, (laughs) I really hated the word (laughs) and when people asked me they were like oh what's and I was like I don't know I've just got this this thing um I would always be afraid that people would think it's contagious Um. and yeah so yeah so tough at that age did did you also have asthma because it's quite common to have both yeah no I don't have asthma my cousins have asthma um but no no asthma at all no other health problems it was just eczema just the skin yeah you also mentioned Camille it's 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 really quite heart-wrenching that your grandma actually used to like make you little mittens to sort of sort of disincentivize you to scratch your skin at night and and also you even asked your granddad if you were ugly because you know of the skin I mean tell us more about how um how they you know they you obviously spoken to them about that since what do they sort of have to say about that yeah so yeah well my grandma obviously made me the mittens to stop me from scratching which was really sweet um but I always pulled them off um and my granddad, yeah, I remember I must have been maybe like 11. And I was just sick and tired of always having sore hands. And I remember turning to him and saying like, granddad, am I ugly? Because I don't even know why it came out. And I was so young. And to say that something like that when you're so young. And he was like, no way. Like, obviously he was devastated at the idea of me thinking that because I had the skin condition. and both of them and even my mom like they were all just like Camille this you are absolutely beautiful this doesn't define you and it just it upset them all to think that I thought that because of my skin um but I I still don't think I believed them you know I thought of course they're gonna say that like they love me yeah yeah of course and and a lot of the stuff you talk about um in your book is about having a strong support network which I think is important like for anybody and anything they go through in life. Um, but also maybe like, you know, maybe we can just talk a part of our podcast is about people's stories and like understanding, you know, a little bit of more about them, where they came from. You, uh, I think you said you were born in Lancashire, which is either part of Manchester or I'm not sure you can tell me. <laughs> Sorry, I should know after living here. For years. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, yeah, t- tell us a little bit about childhood memories, like good things and your family and stuff. Um, so yeah, born in Lancashire. Um, I have three of the siblings and yeah, I went to three different schools growing up or four different schools growing up. So even though I say I'm from Lancashire, which is like half an hour north of Manchester, <laughs> um, I always say Manchester because it's a city. Um, and people recognize it Um, but yeah half an hour north more in the country and um, yeah I come from a self-made like my parents self-made businessman and my mom she was a beautician and then she looked after us and then started studying naturopathic medicine Um, so yeah two very different kind of parents one very like soft and spiritually the one very businessy but I think they were like the perfect balance of parents um, but I've always saw my dad working extremely, extremely hard um, growing up, just trying to give us um, a good life. So we moved around. Well, we didn't move house a lot, but we moved schools a lot. So anytime my dad thought there was like, you know, maybe a better type of education, he would always move us on to the next school. Um, so, yeah, I think that was really good for me to move schools because it always pushed me out of my comfort zone and taught me how to like make new friends um and I think you just learn so much from moving around um so yeah so I went to school called St. Pius and a high school so that was my primary school high school Kirkham 
and then my final school was Stonyhurst and it was boarding school mm. and um, that was probably like my happiest school where I met people from all over the world and I think that's what made it so magical because I was connecting with people from literally everywhere and everyone had like a different story to tell of why they were there and just their own like way of living so I found that really fascinating and really connected with like my Maltese friends Spanish and I just loved it um yeah so happy memories growing up maybe going to the lakes and like playing out in the fresh outdoors like we were always brought up to like play outside and be in nature um mom was always cooking really healthy food um yeah <laughs> I don't want to just ramble on about myself no, no it's it's about you <laughs> don't be shy <laughs> but I can also imagine Camille that I, I mean part of me thinks that it could be quite tough for a young for a youngster to be moving so much do you know do you know what I mean like maybe is that retrospective that you think it was a good thing or did you enjoy sort of moving at the time yeah I mean I it was always when I like I'd finished so I'd outgrow my primary school so we had to go to a new school uh -huh. and then with the high school, I wasn't necessarily happy there. There was a group of girls that just really had it in for me. So I was so excited to leave and go to the boarding school and at the boarding school, I'd been playing like um, sports fixtures against them with my old school. So I knew that they were like really like into being outside and they had so many activities. Mm -hmm. Everyone was so friendly. It just seemed like a different kind of vibe. To the high school that I was at, so I was so excited to go there. So, no, I I think even at the time right. I was like, yes. Uh, <laughs> and your dad was a businessman. What what kind of business was he into, and what kind of stuff was he doing, or is he doing? Um, well, he started off um, as an ice cream man, <laughs> and then he had his own um, car wash business, and then he realized when he was washing cars that the owner of the, you know, the property that he rented off them didn't have to do anything and was getting more money than he was doing all the graft of washing all the cars. Mm -hmm. So that was when he was like, wait, what am I doing? Like I'm working so hard and like I, whether I do good or not, this guy gets my money for the rent. So that's when he was like, okay, I need to get myself into property. So, um, slowly but surely, I think his dad gave him all the rest of his money and he put it into his first property. And then from then onwards, he's, always been in property i mean i don't know his full story like he could have his own um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah chat with you guys but he's he's really done amazing um That's cool. all on his own yeah and mum being a, she studied naturopathic medicine is that right and so i guess that pl plays into some of the stuff that comes back later in the story but did she uh sort of you know talk about that stuff as young you know, when you're younger and you know to teach you about food and things yeah she was always giving us like fish oils around exam time for our brain um she was always like she'd cut pieces of our hair and send them off to see if we were vitamin deficient <laughs> um, she was really like, she's really spiritual and really into nutrition so anything that could help us she would be doing so making us fish and vegetables and we'd be like oh we want pizza um, and she'd be like no this is good for this and this so she hadn't studied in it yet but she was always fascinated about uh. what we put in our body and how it has an effect and you know, she always said to me you know if you eat this egg in the morning then you'll win your cross-country race and I was like okay and I remember thinking I'm gonna win because I got this that's egg. so cool <laughs> yeah. that's very cool. positive reinforcement there <laughs> Yeah, I met, I met, I met your mom at the, uh, we did our final, um, what did, I guess when you call it like uh, cook or what did we do? We, we, you know, we cook for like 20 yes. people or something, didn't we? And your mom was there and, uh, she's such a lovely lady. I can, you know, I can just see where you get all your, you know, your kind heartedness and your big smile and stuff from. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she is. She's lovely. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So Camille, you mentioned a little moment ago about, you know, some, a group of, uh, girls being a little bit tough and that kind of thing but um I, you know when you were, you mentioned that when you were around 13 or so you remember sort of hiding your eczema from your classmates and um your hands were often like really sore and they were even just like typing were it's like painful from the eczema yeah. uh, you'd even wear gloves which would give you some comfort but uh, and also more than that it would sort of prevent 
people seeing your hands. Um, what was uh, sort of the reaction at school and, and how, did, how did the other kids uh, treat you at school? Um, yeah, so I did cover up my hands with the ex- because of the eczema and it was especially either in computer class because your hands are on show, like other classes it would be fine, but I think it's because computer class, your hand, like everyone's hands are out. Um, so I was like, oh my goodness, I don't want people to see my hands. And then it was as well in netball. I wanted to wear gloves because it hurt and I didn't want people to see my hands as well. Um, but both times I wasn't allowed to wear them. So I'd get shouted at, take them off and I'll never forget the time that I took them off. And the guy sat next to me, which was one of my friends, he was like, oh my gosh, what's happened to your hands? Like, and he thought I was self-harming and because there was just scratches everywhere and I was like no 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 like I'm fine and he was like no you're not no you're not no you're not and I was like I am I just have this thing and he was like what thing and I was like I don't know I just scratch when I sleep <laughs> and he was like that doesn't make sense and I was like I know it doesn't make sense to me either and it just like it really upset me because I just felt like I can't even explain like I felt like I was crazy you know I had this thing that nobody else understood and I didn't understand but it was making me scratch every night um and I did have some really good friends like even though there was a massive group of bitchy girls that didn't like me like the popular girls um I had a lot of like I had very close-knit one-to-one friendships and a lot of my friends were guys because I felt like what you see is what you get with a guy they're very straight up um and they wanted to do like fun things like play outside whereas most of the girls I just I didn't click as easily with them and I think I probably got really intimidated by them um you know they, I would be on MSN in the evenings and sometimes I'd be like oh I wouldn't come in school tomorrow like kind of quite threatening messages um and I'd always stand up to them because I've been raised that way like you know never back down to a bully so but there was like about gosh eight of them that would just walk around in a group and just not be very nice to me but yeah and I I guess it kind of played on me like why don't they like me is it do they know I've got eczema or I don't I just never understood I'd never done anything to them um but I think it made me a lot more quieter and more insecure within myself even though I had very good friends yeah, yeah, it's super tough growing up, isn't it? You know, I mean, even just being a normal teenager, you know, even if you've mm-hmm. like everything is okay, you, you're probably still going to get sort of bullied in some sort of way or people are going to call you out. But uh, then when you do have something on top of that, um, it just sort of, you know, adds fuel to the fire. Mm-hmm. Um, Anything a bit different, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, so you also enjoy, you also, sorry, you also said that you loved arts and you loved running um, and that was almost like an escape for you, wasn't it? Yeah, I absolutely love those. Running in particular, it was just like, it made me feel so free and I was so good at it. So, you know, most of the time I would win the race. So it's, <laughs> it's like an amazing feeling. And I think it just, it was where I excelled in and, you know, it didn't matter what I looked like. Um, It was just, yeah, it was such a freeing thing, you know, and you're totally in control of how fast you run. I think that was a control thing as well. You know, I can win that race if I want to. It's all about mental determination and I would achieve something at the end. And I just loved it and I knew it was good for me. Well, I didn't. My mom told me it was good for me. Um, (laughs) Vets and eggs. (laughs) (laughs) Those eggs make me win. Um, Yeah. And I think as well, I thought that I would be liked if I kept winning all the races, you know, by these girls that didn't like me. I thought, oh my gosh, they must think, oh, so cool. She keeps winning the race. Mm. But no, like they still didn't. Um, And then art, yeah, I absolutely loved it because it was just a way of expressing myself, which whatever was going on inside of me and you know I love messy art not like the fine art I just splat paint and do scrapbooks and just felt so free again to express myself yeah and you know what that actually comes out exactly what you said there how you like your art in your book I mean if you you, I get just my thoughts on it like how you've the font you've chosen um the the logo and stuff you know it's like a nice sort of splashy kind of um yeah 
Yeah, that's why I did that. Because I remembered like making scrapbooks growing up and that's where all like the tears come. Because I'd never cut things neatly. It would always be tears and I just love like a messy masterpiece. So yeah, that's where it all came from. (laughs) A messy Messy masterpiece. masterpiece. I like that. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's classic. I think it's so important to have like that outlet as well sometimes. And it just, sometimes it just fills this certain space within your your soul like to to be creative and to i I think it's such an uh, important thing for people to explore actually is like the creative side and it doesn't always have to be neat and perfect does it when it's when it's yours exactly exactly Mm. and so you mentioned earlier that even though you were running and you were trying to be a bit more like popular that obviously didn't always happen or work and there was actually an incident at school where the sort of the girls really tease you a lot and they actually put uh, or, or poured some crisps in your hair uh, when you're on the bus, uh, yeah. you know, to and from athletics and stuff. How did, how did that feel? Yeah, I mean, again, it just, it's baffling to look back on. And I just think about poor like, little me. I was always really quiet at school and I was actually really shy. Um, I still say I'm an introvert unless I feel comfortable with someone and I get that really good, genuine vibe of someone, then I'll just like open up. But if I feel a little bit like, oh, this vibe doesn't feel right. I'm just so quiet. Um, and it's probably because of what happened at school. And because I was winning the race and I was quite good, I was put with the older years, like to run with them. So I wasn't with anyone in my year. Mm. And I'd go on the bus with them and I was like, oh, this is kind of like scary. They're the older years. Um, but then I thought, oh, no, they must think like quite cool. I'm, you know, younger and still able to run with them. Um, but yeah, I'd be on the bus, sat there on my own, and they, on the way to the athletics match, they like were pour, pouring crisps on my head. And I was like, just sat there, like feeling really upset. And I didn't have the confidence to turn around to them all because they were the older years and there was a massive group of them to be like, what are you doing? Like, stop doing that. So I just sat there letting them pour crisps on me, like feeling really upset. And I just said to myself, it was like, it's fine, Camille, once you get to the athletics, you're going to win the race by so far ahead that they're going to like, they won't do it on the way back. So got to the athletics, won, ran, uh, won the race by like a lap ahead and, I, and they were all cheering. And I was like, yes, like no Chris on the head. <laughs> <laughs> and then on the way back, I sat there and I was like, and then they did the same thing. They were oh, still just man. laughing, poking, throwing Chris on the head and, I look back and I just wish I could like give little me like a bit of advice and be like, just tell them to stop. Mm. But I think, you know, when there's a big group of people and you're that young, you do just feel like really vulnerable. And like, again, I was just like, I don't understand what I'm doing wrong here. You know, my year, popular girls that like me, the older years didn't like me. And it was like, I just don't understand. Like, what have I done? Yeah. But I just think girls... I mean, people can just be mean, can't they? And they can pick someone. I was small. Um, yeah, maybe an easy target. I, I, often, I mean, for me, it's just like, this is their own insecurities. You know, they, they're just jealous. I know they're young, they're kids, and that's kind of what you do. But often it's a reflection of, of how you feel. And, you know, yeah. they're probably like, oh, she's so good at running. What can we make her, her bad at? You know what I mean? <laughs> and bully her at. But also like what you said now, like, I don't think there's, there's much worse than humiliation um, and especially humiliation in front of your peers. You know, that, that must have been just very tr- traumatic for, for you. Yeah, I remember getting off the bus and just like getting picked up, running to my parents and just bursting into tears. And they were like, oh no, like, did you not do very well? I was like, no, I, I won't. Like, but mm. I'm just not enjoying being around these people. Like, mm. I'm not liked. It must be really hard for parents as well, hey, geez, to, to like see their child going through that. And then what do you do as a parent, you know? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Be angry, just, you know? Yeah. I mean, I would, if my child comes yeah. home like that, I'd be so angry. And actually, before I went to that school, I went to do a scholarship somewhere. I don't know if I'd put this in the book. And it was a sports scholarship, so I could get a discount on the school I was going to. And I went to do it on my own and I saw this group of girls and I must have been around, gosh, I'm not sure how old you are when you're maybe like 10. And I saw them all and I was like, hey, 
breathe, be confident, just walk over, tell them who you are. So I remember like walking over like, hi, I'm Camille, like so excited to the scholarship, like what's your name? And like the main girl just stood up, she was really tall, like long one hair and she was like, let's move. And they all just no. got up and no. followed her and, and left no. me. And I was like, this is before I'd even started the scholarship. And I was like, oh my gosh, I wanna cry, I wanna cry. I was like, no. hold it together. Yeah, and then all the t I did the day of the sports scholarship and came out, ended up having won the scholarship with the girl that hated, well, the girl that walked away from me. And I just said to my mum, I really can't, I can't go to that school. Like, I've tried, but no. <laughs> I just kept having these things. So mm, yeah. I would just put myself out of my comfort zone and then kind of like have it, you know, thrown back in my face. That's really so, hard. That's really hard. Wow. Yeah, that to is actually super. get out of that comfort zone and then still be like shut down you know it's not it's not like yeah. in the movies necessarily <laughs> yeah wow. yeah so but I think all of those experiences have made me who I am now so if I ever see someone that seems like they're on their own or I'm very empathetic and I think um because of those experiences I know what it's like to be left out I know what it's like to be judged or not liked and I try and scoop everyone under my arms now and um, make them feel comfortable. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I must say you're, you're an extremely uh, strong lady, that's for sure. And like, <laughs> overcoming all of that, is, you know, is, is extremely tough, especially when you're so young. Um, but, but also talking about schools and stuff. And um, I know that you, you had like a couple of fresh starts. Um, like you mentioned earlier, you went to different schools and you had a, a fresh start uh, by going to a new private school. Yeah. Um, which I guess must have been good, but then also other things that sort of started happening as like, you know, you became more aware of uh, what was good for you in terms of your X Men stuff. I know that you you mentioned uh, you had an allergy test um, at one point, and then as part of like that, when you went to the new school, you kind of changed your diet as a result as well. Is that the kind of right sequence of how it happened? Or yes, so this was the boarding school that I went to, which I was like so happy about. New start. Everyone was so nice and it was like three quarter boys to girls. So I felt like there just couldn't be any bitchiness because it was like quite a laddish kind of mentality. Um, and yeah, so when I went there, I was like, okay, in the evenings, people are going to see me because I'm it's boarding school, I'm staying over. So whereas at my old schools, I'd go home and I'd have my eczema cream and my bandages I was like, oh no, I can't have that at this school. Like I have to have clear skin. Like I don't want anyone to see the person that I used to hide. Mm. So that's when I was, you know, I was older, I was a bit wiser and I said to my mom, I need to find out something, why this is happening to me. Like this isn't just something that I'm going to live with. It's happening to me. So she was like, okay, we'll get the allergy test on. And that's when I found out I was gluten intolerant, um, dairy intolerant. And then a list of other foods came up, like tomatoes, lettuce, like things you wouldn't even think. Mm. So I was like, okay, brilliant. So glad that I know that I'm going to avoid everything on that list and I'm going to be glowing. Uh, and I'm quite a determined person. So when, some, <laughs> when I want to do something, I will do it. So I gave that list to the, um, the kitchen people at school and said, I can't eat any of those. I think they just put it to the side. They were like, this girl's on one. Um, and yeah, I just made sure I didn't touch any of that food. So if it was served to us, I would ignore it. And my meals would probably be, in the morning I'd have a banana because it would either be continental or like full English. So I was like, ooh, don't know what, what's in there. So I'd just have a banana. And then for lunch, I would have um, like a jacket potato with something or like chicken and veg. And then for dinner, always the dinners, I was like, they just, well, because we had foreigners, we'd always do different types of cultured food. Mm. So I was just like, I'll avoid dinner and I'll just have peas. Like literally mm. every dinner, I just have a bowl of peas because I was like, there's more nutrition in this bowl of peas than whatever's in there. Um, so I did this for like, a good like two years of being at school and wow. my skin was glowing I was still able to like drink alcohol even though I was underage but yeah we did drink alcohol <laughs> um and yeah my skin was glowing but I was wow. really really happy at that school I had an amazing group of friends I was netball captain I was doing well in my like subjects at school and everyone was really really kind and friendly and I just mm was so I think 
yeah, I was just so happy there. So this, there wasn't much stress. <laughs> just the, yeah, just the, the glowing, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Just a side, uh, a side question. Uh, do you still like peas? <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> I do like peas, but not a bowl. Like, <laughs> I look back, I'm like, what? I remember people going, what are you eating? And I'd be like, po. Don't question me. You're having pizza. Yeah. I'm having pizza. <laughs> Would you put some gravy on there at least? Come on. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, wow. Absolutely crazy. Yeah. Wow. But Camille, as a sort of a, a bit of a result of that, I guess um, you actually became quite thin, and you know your skin was good, stress was down. You'd found your little niche and your your place of people, which is which is great. Um, uh, but obviously, you know, losing a lot of weight, but you also had sort of dreams of becoming a model. So being thin was also good for that on, on the one hand, I guess, uh, the way it is. Um, but yeah, you'd also get really, really tired and, and sometimes you'd go to bed at like early seven o'clock or something. Uh, you also became a little bit less social and, and, uh, maybe more controlling and obsessive. How, how did sort of these things pan out as a result of all that? Yeah, so that was like nearing the end of like school, you know, like the second year. I know I was dropping loads of weight. And like you said, at the time, I was kind of like, that's great. I want to be a model. Like back then, like we idolize really like unhealthy, you know, really slim figures. And I remember having fashion pictures all over my bedroom wall at school. And it was like, you know, tiny is good. Um, and yeah so I was getting obsessive and seven o'clock was our um time where we could go and have fun with everyone after studies and I remember thinking oh if I stay up with everyone then I'm going to get hungry and I don't want to and I, I'll, I won't be as in control so I kept going to bed really early to avoid oh, yes. feeling hungry until the next morning I could have just a banana it's crazy um yeah so I was just very controlled like that became more introverted just through the fear of getting my eczema back I was like I can't physically deal with that so I'd rather be less social not eat as much and be in control of it hmm. so yeah it became it came very obsessive um and a bit too like at first it was a way of keeping my eczema away but this was now like oh my gosh I actually fear what I put in my mouth, mm -hmm. um, which I didn't realize at the time because we'd go home at weekends to see family and they'd cook like a Sunday roast or something. And I'd be like, oh no, no, I can't have that. Like, and I'd walk out the room mm -hmm. and they noticed I started having a bit of an eating disorder and they were like, but they probably, I don't know, they were quite forceful about it. They're like Camille, like you need to see you've got a problem. And that made me more upset because I was like, you've no idea what I have to live with if I eat that food. So I'm not taking your opinion. Like, mm. I don't want to have eczema again. Um, mm. So, yeah, I isolated myself and restricted my diet. Yeah. Sure. It becomes a real vicious cycle, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 And, no. uh, yeah. Wow. It's hectic. And so, I mean, during this time, you know, when you were becoming more obsessive and, and controlled, like, uh, what, what, and you mentioned now, like you also went home on weekends. W were those good moments for you? Do you remember like good times, uh, other good times as well? Or? Um, so, I mean, I'm sure there was, but I, I just remember controlling, like I would be, it would be like a fear thing. Like, okay, on Sundays I'm going to be at home. So how am I going to avoid this food scenario? Mm. Like it would be probably the most strongest point of my mind. You know, when everyone's laughing and joking over dinner, I'm there like freaking out <laughs> or like mm. just sat there pretending to eat because I don't want them to worry about me. Mm. Um, so I think, oh, yeah. yeah. So even though I was glowing mentally, I was definitely not in a good place. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah. So you'd link yeah. like the the sorry you'd link the this this idea in your mind of like I'm doing this for the eczema, but on a, a real deeper subconscious level, you kind of knew as well that it was probably more than that, like the weight thing as well. Yeah. The control. yeah, yeah, it's the control. The I think it's all started with the eczema, and the eczema was the the focal point, but it was like yeah. 
I was quite happy about having glowing skin and being slim. Yeah. So it was like, I have no reason to change what I'm doing. Mm. Um, and I remember going to the doctors, but this was like a year later when I got really serious and the doctors was like, Camille, you don't start to gain weight. You will not be able to have children. And wow. that was the turning point for me to start. It was like where I became really aware of how thin I was. Mm. So I was like, oh, I thought I was healthy. You know? <laughs> was so, it like bordering on anorexia or anything like that? So, I, mean, I mean, I never like to throw that word out there because I don't, I don't believe it was that. I think orthorexia is the mm. word I would say because it was, wasn't the trying. I mean, yeah, I was eating like as little as possible. You know, I'd go days. If I couldn't find the right food, I would happily not eat or have like the smallest thing like oh. if if we went on a walk um and my mum found some cafe and it did like a jacket potato which i didn't think was a good food back then um and like coffee and tea i'd be like oh, i'll have a water <laughs> you know and everyone would be like please eat and i'm like i'm fine <laughs> and i was clearly not fine so i don't I, w I don't like to give titles for anything but if there was anything, I'd say orthorexia because it was just mm. the fear of nothing being pure enough. Sure. Wow. Yeah. And you mentioned your mental state a moment ago. How was your self-confidence? I mean, it's, I could picture it being both. Like maybe you had some self-confidence because you were, you were thin and you, your skin was good, but at the same time, also maybe not. Yeah. I mean, I was super happy my skin was glowing. Um, but because it was such a controlled thing and because I wasn't eating that much, my energy was so low. So I wasn't like as bubbly as I am these days because I couldn't, I didn't have that much energy. So I would say on the, on the outside, I looked glowing and I knew I did, but the, my inside, my personality, my spark wasn't really there. Sure. It's amazing. Like, you know, the, what you see on the outside is just often not what's going on the inside, hey? Yeah, it's, this is why I talk a lot about like the mental aspects in my book, because I think that, that that your mental health is so, so, so important, you know, whether when living a healthy life, even if it's eczema or, or something else, I think everything starts in your mind. And like, that's how I, I truly had the turning point with my eczema was when I realized how strong my mind was. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's yeah. just, it's so important with everything. Hey, mindset. Um, definitely agree with you for sure. So talking about things starting to turn around, uh, you spent a year in California and yeah. during that year, it sounded like you, you really started finding yourself again. The eczema literally disappeared um, maybe you can just take us through that journey and how it was for you. Yeah. So when I left the boarding school, I went to uni and that's when I struggled again. And the journey to California was me trying to escape English winter <laughs> <laughs> and, um, kind of a lifestyle, a different culture again. I missed my friends, you know, I, because I went to boarding school, all my friends went back to their countries. I didn't have a support network in England anymore. And I felt like the university culture was very much around drinking and partying and I couldn't keep up with it. And it was making my eczema flare up. Um, so I was like, I need to escape this somehow. Like, I don't know what to do. So I found the study abroad program where I could study abroad in America. And the first time I got it, I got New York and I was like, oh no, it's too cold there. Um, <laughs> so I canceled, reapplied and then got California and I, that was where one student from California goes to my English uni, I go to theirs. Um, so that was like a dream come true. And most people don't look into these programs. It's really funny. Like not, no one really applied at my uni to do this. And I was like, this is like an amazing opportunity. Um, so yeah, so I did that and I was so happy. It was a warmer climate. Everyone was really friendly and bubbly. Um, I felt like I could express my personality through my clothes, like wear more like hippie clothes. Everyone was a bit more spiritual. Everyone was into health. And it just felt like all the puzzle pieces like slotted together. And I was in like this little happy bubble of Camille land. And it was just like, oh my gosh, this is like a dream. Um, and I had that for six months that I was there. And I wanted to live there. I was like, I'm so happy I found my place. And I had to come home because the 
study abroad program finished um but i think that experience helped me realize that the happier i am the less eczema i have when I'm unhappy, I get more eczema. So it was, again, the big learning that it was more than what I put in my body. Um, it was the climate, it was the way I thought, and it was who I had around me. So it was all these different elements. Um, and then I knew going back to England would be really difficult. But I was like, yeah, it's my family's there, so that's fine. Um, and I moved back when it was like the coldest winter in England, I'd found an internship for a health company and I was like, yes. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I think I just pushed myself too much. It was cold. Um, my job, I was really confused what I was doing. I was commuting like an hour and a half every day. Um, living in a place where I had no friends. I wasn't able to exercise. Um, and my eczema started creeping back. Hmm. and it just it started on my arms and I was like okay okay don't panic Camille and I was working for a health company as well and I was like Camille you can't be sick like pull yourself together and the restrictive eating came back in I was trying to do everything I could to control the situation stop sleeping was waking up with blood like all over the sheets dry skin it was like it really quickly as soon as I got back to England like escalated downwards and it was terrifying and every doctor that I saw they were like here's steroid cream like you know it was just cream 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 that wasn't really helping and um, like my hair was irritating me I cut my hair short I just really started to lose who I was all over again and yeah it was a really really scary time and yeah, so then I flew to the Dead Sea. I think my mum was like, okay, Camille, I've heard this is really good, like salt water. So I was like, okay, I'm going to do that on my own. Flew to the Dead Sea for a juicing retreat for two weeks. And I was like, I don't need to juice. <laughs> like, but I was like, I need just pure stuff in me for two weeks. So got there, three days on juice, going in the Dead Sea where, can you imagine like one tiny cut and some salt? Like oh my, my whole body was covered in cuts and I went in and honestly I would never ever wish if anyone said to me shall I go to the Dead Sea when they've got eczema I'd say no not yeah. a chance like I'm strong and I just it was literally felt like I was burning my body I literally ran out of the sea got in this long queue to like get into the shower and everyone didn't speak English but they could see how much pain I was in that they like pushed me to the front of the shower just to like wash it all off. And I just remember crying in the shower thinking, Oh my God, please someone help me. Like praying to God, like mm. seriously, just stop. Why am I going through this? I'm a good person. <laughs> um, but I did it. I did it every single day for two weeks and it did really help. It was like the most antagonizing experience. It was horrible my mum came out and helped me I stopped the juicing I started to eat food after day three and it really helped there was a really nice yoga woman there that helped me and I was like yes I'm in control of my skin like it wasn't totally clear but it wasn't like I'm gonna go into hospital and on the last day found out I'd lost my job and that they didn't want me to return and I, I wasn't what I sold myself as and I was just like oh my god my life like my ex was ruining my life um, and came back to England. And then the next day, my ex just blew up again. Ah, so, oh, my God. So tough. Yeah. Eh? Like, so it's crazy. Wow. It, it's amazing. Like what you said, it's like, it's all these things add to it. You know, it's your surroundings. It's uh, the stress that you go through. It's about whatever. It's uh, really impacted it so much, your, your eczema. It's, uh, and, and, um, I was watching, Craig and I was, were watching the video on the About You page on your website and how I'm like going like this now with my body. Um, I was doing that when I was looking at the photos of um, how bad your eczema was. It was, I mean, I can't even imagine what it must have been like going into that dead sea with mm. your skin like that. It must have been so painful. Yeah, like there are no words for that pain. Like I've never felt, and I think that's why I'm very fearless now because I feel like there's nothing anyone can do to me that mm. is going to be more painful than that experience. Um, yeah, I was so young as well. Like I'm 27 now. I know that's still young, but I, 
but I was only 21 then and I'm just like you know you're growing up you're trying to learn about yourself and life and be an adult and get your lives together and I felt like I couldn't focus on anything I couldn't you know be good at my job or be a good in a good in a good relationship or anything because mm. I had this condition yeah. it was taking over my life um sure. I, I just wanted it to end but I mean that I, I would have been you mentioned earlier but I would have been the same like asking why you know like why is my body doing this to me why can't I feel happy like how frustrating must it have been for you? Like besides the, the physical pain, like the mental pain of it, of like, I want to thrive. I, I'm a, you know, and then you get people, I guess this could have been frustrating too, is people like everyone's giving you advice. Like, oh, maybe you should try this and try this and try that and just change your mindset and whatever it is. And then you, and it's still there. And, oh, it must have just been so hard for you, like mentally, and which has obviously made you more mentally tough as well now. Yeah, it truly was. And, you know, I don't regret the experience that I've gone through, though, because, like like I said back then, like, why me? I'm a good person. I've not done anything wrong. Like, I tried to question my whole character. I was like, okay, like, you wanted to be a model. Maybe you were struggling with vanity. You need to realize that beauty is skin deep for me. Like, I questioned everything about myself and was like, no, I'm a good person. Like, seriously why are you doing this and like now I look back and I'm like okay Camille you were given that challenge because you were strong enough to deal with it and there's so many other people in the world suffering that by you going through that you were able to learn the tools that are going to benefit someone's life now and I like to believe that I had to go through that that has given me a purpose and wisdom that is going to help millions of people that are suffering in silence Mm. um and it's yeah so like when I hit rock bottom and went into hospital and my face went double the size, I'd not seen my friends in ages, how isolated myself. Mm. I remember thinking back then, I don't want to exist anymore. Like I've hit like rock bottom too many times. Look at me. I can't even look at myself. I don't want to exist. Like I don't want to exist. And that I, yeah, it was just like a black hole couldn't see anything else um and then went into hospital they said you know there's nothing we can do I was showing them pictures of me with glowing skin I was like that's me (laughs) this isn't me help me (laughs) help me get back to me you know because I think people they see you sometimes and they think that's how you are and here's like a pill or a tablet and I was like no this isn't me I'm in so much pain and they said we're really sorry Camille you're an adult now you've not grown out of the condition and the best we can do is give you steroids and antidepressants to cope with it. And I just remember like, it was like, I couldn't hear any noise around me anymore. I just looked at the hospital and it was like, I'd just been given like a death sentence. I was just like, I, and I was alone there. I was with someone that I was working for because everyone else was out. And I just remember thinking like, I had no words. I was done. I was completely and utterly done. Um, Didn't know who to turn to. Didn't want to call my friends because no one could help me. You know, back then my dad didn't even know how ill I was because he'd call up and be like, hey, how are you? Like work stressful. And I didn't want to be an extra liability to him. So I'd be like, Mm -hmm. yeah, everything's great. Fine. And my friends, they'd be like, why aren't you hanging out? Like, why don't you Skype anymore? And I just thought, I don't want you to see what I look like. Like, none of you can help me. So I pushed them all away. Um, yeah. So you really isolated yourself, eh? And it's, uh, I guess that, that people think that is like a coping mechanism, um, a way to overcome things, but it's uh, it's almost the opposite. And it's not what you you sort of... Uh, encourage people to do now is like get that support network so maybe we can just like um understand this a little bit more like in terms of how things got better so in in the book you know obviously you're you're in a hospital there you're 21 years old you've been given this diagnosis that you you literally like okay i can't live with this because that's just you know it's gonna just drive me right down but you mentioned that your mom um 
told you that it was good to see a NLP practitioner. But you, before that, I think you read the book called The Secrets, uh, which sort of, sort of started shifting your perspective. So um, was there anything else? Like, did you change your diet? I know that you mentioned you've done a ridiculous amounts of things as well, but you started eating meat again. Uh, maybe we can just go through that sort of journey of recovery or self-discovery. Yeah. Okay. So when I was in hospital, I had been juicing and re- avoiding every kind of food under the sun because I thought if that worked at boarding school, then that should work now. Um, but it wasn't. And I just didn't understand why. And I was actually vegan then. I didn't eat any meat or fish. Um, I was eating hardly anything again. And I was wondering why I was sick because I wasn't putting anything impure in my body so when I started to heal so my mum gave me the book the secret to read because she was like Camille you need to shift your mindset you have a great life and I was like what I don't like look at me Mm -hmm. and she was like Camille you do like you've got legs you can go on a run and I was like fine and she would like make me write down 10 positive statements every morning like of what I'm grateful for and if it wasn't like good enough, she'd be like, right, we write another one. Mm-hmm. And I'd get a bit annoyed with her. I was like, oh, why does she think this is going to help? Like, I'm fine with being miserable because I am struggling, <laughs> you know, and I felt like being miserable was giving me the determination to do something about it rather than, I never wanted to be complacent. I never wanted to take anti- antidepressants, which I didn't because I didn't want to be okay. Cause I was like, yeah. I, I'm not okay. I'm quite happy realizing I'm not okay um so yeah she thought it was a real mind thing and she got me to read the secret got me to write down 10 things I'm grateful for every morning and so it was helping me be happier and more positive I was still going to sleep and literally scratching all the skin off my body Mm. and yeah and I'd wake up in oozing blood more cuts more dry skin and it was such like mental mentally draining every day it was like oh my god like it's like how do I fight another day like oh my god like and then I got Mm -hmm. yeah I got afraid of sleeping I moved beds I was like I hate I hate going to sleep because I know that crazy (laughs) things are going to happen it was like some kind of werewolf came out when I went to sleep Mm -hmm. um and yeah so that's when she was like okay I found an NLP practitioner I'd really like you to go and see him And I was like, not a chance am I talking to someone like this is a physical problem, not a mental problem. Mm. And she was like, please just speak on the phone to him. Like, you don't have to go. And I was like, nope, 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 nope. I don't want to see anyone and or speak to him. I don't want to. So she called him, put him on the phone to me. And I was like, what's she done? And then I got the phone. I was like, hi. And he was like, hi, Camille. And he just knew what to say. (laughs) He was like, such a lovely guy and he's like why don't you just come chat to me and I was like okay like he just made me feel comfortable so I was like okay fine I'll just I'll make my mum happy and go um and then when I went to see him I just he just said ask the right questions and I was in tears for hours pouring out how I felt about everything going on in my life and I things I didn't even realize or upset about and he came to the conclusion, he was like, you feel trapped. And I was like, what? And he went, you feel trapped in your skin. You feel trapped in your environment. You were really happy in California. Like everything is out of your control. And when you go to sleep, you're like literally like tearing at your skin to escape. And it, it made so much sense to me. I was like, oh my gosh, he's like hit the nail on the head. I do. And he would be like, okay, what's the worst case scenario of this? And he would flip everything I felt negative about and turn it into a positive so he'd be like make me say statements like I'm such an intelligent young woman I'm going to get an amazing job and it's going to give me an abundance of money and I can move abroad you know like everything that I want to do he would put that statement out there for me and I, I was like but do you actually think that I am intelligent like do you think I'll be able to get a job like because I'd obviously been fired and he was like of course you are you're very articulate and he just make me believe in myself and write these statements. And he said, right, I want you to go home and say those, repeat them to yourself, like affirmations every day. And if you're struggling, give me an email. I was like, okay. Went home that night and it was the first night in about a year or eight months that I slept without scratching. No way. No way. 
Yeah. And I wake up and I was like, oh my gosh, like game changer. <laughs> like it, I didn't realize how much my mind had a connection to my body. That's um, incredible. Yeah. C- can you maybe just for our listeners, just explain a little bit about NLP, what it actually is? Yeah. So it stands for Neuro Linguistic Reprogramming. And it's a way of rewiring the subconscious mind. So your subconscious mind is more dominant and you don't really have much control over it. So by using NLP techniques, go see a practitioner, they help you work through what is going on back there and they create positive statements that you affirm to yourself that will reprogram the subconscious mind so that it's more likely your body's going to act on whatever's there. That's my best way of yeah no it. no that's super yeah. good so, so so do you still use like affirmations and stuff to this day like do you have a morning routine around that yeah got my positive affirmation pack that i made oh, that's so um, cool. <laughs> yeah i made that because a lot of people message me and say camille i just don't understand how you are so positive i don't know what to say to myself and not everyone can go out and get an nlp session so i thought i would need to make a tool that people can just buy and like if people just take one of these cards out every morning and affirm it to themselves that it's related to my hope principles then I believe that it will help them shift their mindset to be more positive so yeah I do them every day I either pick one from my pack or I just think okay like for this podcast I was like okay I want to be confident I want to be bubbly and I'll say I am confident I and I say those things look myself in the mirror and I just affirm it to myself and then yeah every single day that's great awesome (laughs) we've been trying to do more affirmations in our morning routine and it's it's uh, really powerful to just do it's it's amazing how you can wake up in a with a certain tone to your feelings and then um, by just doing that, it, it can actually literally just shift that that sort of feeling tone of the day, doesn't it? So but powerful, I, yeah. I was wondering, you know, you'd been through, you'd sitting there in the hospital, they're like, oh, you've got, this is your choice. You've got the dep- antidepressants and hydrocortisone creams. Good luck, you know? Yeah. And I still don't know, like, why is it such a weird concept to people to think of like the mind-body connection and as soon as you say the word like wellness or holistic or something, people think you're a tree hugging hippie, but you're like a prime example of, of some, some like a reason why you should uh, explore the, the sort of the person as a whole and not just go like cover up, cover up symptoms, cover up symptoms the whole time. Uh, you must have some feelings about that. Yeah, totally. I mean, I've always felt that once I became aware of my eczema, that it was a symptom and a sign that something was wrong. And I felt like the creams were masking that, you know, and I knew it was eventually going to come back out. So I've always believed in like a holistic approach, but I always thought it was a nutrition thing. I didn't actually realize how powerful the mind was with the body. Um, and yeah, I, I think medical definitely has its place, but I think it's so important to combine it with lifestyle. Yeah. 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 I agree with that. People seem but, to, yeah, it's amazing. We just seem to forget like, you know, that we coped for such a long time with, without modern day medicine and, um, you know, you put it, you know, perfectly that they actually can go hand in hand pretty well together. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. And and you mentioned Camille as well, just before we move on to like some more of your, your strategies and, and how you get through things. Um, how did you maintain like relationships with like boyfriends and stuff? It must've been super hard. Like how, I know this is a bit personal, like, but like having someone just hold you and touch you and, and like see your body, you know, like yeah. it must've been really tough as well. Yeah, it was. It, I mean, I look back and I'm like, I just don't know how he, he was really strong, obviously, to be with me. And I was, I kept kind of trying to push him away. I kept saying to him, look at me, this is my fate, like, go. Mm. Because we started off as friends first. So then we got into a relationship and it was long distance. We'd always supported each other. 
And then obviously I, eczema, he'd always knew, knew I had eczema, but I was controlling it very well at the beginning of the relationship. And then obviously it got that bad where I was in hospital and I turned to him and I'm like, I can't even look at myself. Like I didn't want to share a bed with him. I didn't, I just was mm. just like, I, I don't like me. So how can you like me? And he was like, Camille, you are not your skin condition. You are the most beautiful person inside and you will get well again. And, you know, it breaks me down. It broke me down to tears. And I was mm. so lucky to have someone that could see me for me when I couldn't even see me for me. Um, and I'm not with that guy anymore. We stay friends to this day. And that was obviously a really hard experience for us both to go through. Like, mm. obviously I went through it, but he was there with me. So I, I'm sure he went through it all as well. Mm. Um, but yeah, I, it was really difficult, but I'm really lucky. And a lot of people that I speak to that live with eczema, like their partners are so supportive. And I think when you love someone and you see them for who they are, you see past what they're yeah. struggling with. And I would have done the same for him, you know, and yeah, but That's yeah. It, it must be, it must be difficult to be intimate then, you know, like, I guess, like Craig said, just someone putting their arm around you, hugging you, never mind being properly intimate. Yeah. It must be extremely, almost impossible maybe. It was, uh-huh. it was not easy. And I, I think the thing is my heart really goes out to people that may be listening to this, that are in that place. And what I want them to know is that they are beautiful no matter what they're going through and that it is your insides that make you beautiful and beauty's in the eyes. And even if our skin's all teared apart, like we can still have beautiful, beautiful eyes. So mm. yeah, I think. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, for sure. So, so do you still um, ever struggle with things like flare ups at all? Do you, does it ever still happen to you? Yes, I do struggle with flare-ups when I've been going through some personal stuff in my life. It's been really stressful and it's a real shame because the flare-ups happened, started happening again after the launch of my book and I was like, oh my gosh, no. Um, But then I've just realized it makes me human and I have eczema and if I follow my hope principles, then I'm most likely not going to have a flare-up, but you can't control life. And if things are going to have an impact on my mental health, then they're going to have an impact on my skin. So I do my best to like keep my mental health healthy. And then I'm more likely to have healthy skin, obviously all the nutrition as well. Hmm. Yeah, It's a good barometer for you to, to know where you're at and, and you obviously listen to your body very closely now. And, but I guess yeah. it's still a bit scary at times when you, you think, geez, I, I see it coming like, okay, let me make some changes. Let's hope that it, you know, goes back down or calms back down, you know? Yeah. It can be like a terrifying trigger where it reminds me of how bad it could be. Um, But I try and see it as like a friend that is saying, Hey, this isn't good for you. You need to get away from that. Or, you know, like it's just a signal that I'm not in the best place for me as a person. So I try and listen early on without ignoring it. So if I get a flare up now, I'm like, okay, thank you. Cause I kind of knew that and that like a gut feeling inside. I need to make certain choices to make it easier for myself. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So geez, it's been an amazing story, but I just want to say like, I'm so, I'm so proud of you. Um, you know, seeing how much you've achieved since, uh, since we finished our um, chef certification together and, you know, you literally come on leaps and bounds. I remember like talking to you, you know, during the days when we'd be in the kitchen and you'd be like, yeah, I'm building my website. And then you had a few issues with that. And, um, yeah. but you overcome those as you've overcome everything in your entire life, which is just brilliant. Um, so maybe you can tell us about setting up your own business, um, what it actually is and, uh, yeah, all yours. Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, setting up a business hasn't been like an easy road. Um, first got the wrong kind of website developers on board where they didn't really believe in my kind of, um, I don't know what the word is, like my beliefs. I didn't have to share the same values and the message I was trying to, to put out there. And at first I thought that doesn't matter. They just need to build the website. Mm-hmm. But then I realized they kept having conflicting beliefs. Like they were very 
hardcore medical, not into holistic. And I just kept finding myself having really stressful meetings about building the website. So I was like, oh my goodness, like I can't do this any longer. It was just going down completely the wrong path. Um, so stopped and restarted and realized that I just wanted to be able to share my story with as many people as possible in the easiest way. So that's when I thought, actually, I need to write a book, get that into the world. The website can be a platform to share like blogs and tips. And eventually I wanted it to be like a shop for everyone to buy like Exmo Warrior products. Um, and then that's where YouTube and the Instagram came in because it was just different platforms to share my story, to give hope. So the whole foundation of the business is like a mission to share hope for people to live their best life beyond eczema. So I'm not necessarily claiming that I can heal people and heal their eczema, but I can show them the best way to live a life beyond it and not let it control their life. And they can live a positive one. And yeah, so that's like the mission behind the beauty of eczema. And hence why I called it the beauty of eczema because I wanted a massive positive spin on the word eczema which i didn't like so if we can all see the beauty in it it's like a a positive thing for your mental health anyway and as soon as you shift that into a the way you view your skin in a positive way you're more likely to heal just by that alone hmm. um yeah so website book then i went on to making the affirmation cards in the journal just more tools that I felt like I needed as an eczema warrior that I thought could benefit others' lives in, again, the easiest way. So at first I wanted to just be a health coach and do one-to-one -one sessions, but realized that was expensive for people and also took a lot of time. Whereas a book can reach as many people as possible. YouTube can, blog can. And when people say to me, how are you positive? You can have so many coaching calls, but a pack of affirmation cards that's the starting point. It's just a useful tool. And then the journaling as well. It's a bit like self NLP. You're figuring out and you're positively affirming things when you're writing them down. So people don't have to go and think, Oh my gosh, I need to pay for an NLP session. It was like trying to get them the basics of being able to live their best life beyond eczema. Um, yeah, I I'm actually shocked at how much <laughs> I've managed to do in the space of sh such a short period of time. But I have got an amazing team that helped me. Um, I've got like a core team that I work with every single day and someone that is really experienced in the business world mentoring me. So I'm really lucky um, to have that. And also someone that's amazing at design and can get bring my vision mm. onto these amazing products. Mm, um amazing. yeah so i don't know if i could give business advice because i'm definitely just learning every single day <laughs> you know there's highs there's lows things go wrong and you just have to adapt but i'm just lucky i've got a team around me that make it easier mm. oh, collaboration well, again hey like how important is that to to just share in that in that together and together you can do something better than if you were just on your own you know it's, it's really cool and, and talking about tribes like that you, you I would imagine that some of the people that are part of your tribe are not just people that are suffering with eczema because your your message kind of goes beyond obviously only eczema and I presume a big drive is just to help people in general just live a better bigger happier healthier life 100 percent. I think it's just helping people live a positive life yeah, find self-love and yeah, just live their best life. You know, I know it sounds quite cliche, but people, yeah, first come to me maybe with eczema and some people may just want more glowing skin, even if they don't have a skin condition. Mm. And then others, again, just want to feel positive and happy. And yeah, and a lot of people do ask me about business and how I've managed to do what I've done and I try and help them and I hope once I've got it all figured out, um, I'll give them more advice. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I'm not sure anyone knows the end answer to business. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we definitely have no idea. We're still trying to figure that one out. Um, but talking about like business and books, like one of the things that we are super interested in ourselves is actually writing a book. And you know, you and I have obviously chatted separately, um, you know, on the side and stuff. And you, you self-publish your book here which is yeah. an amazing book like seriously well done like it's, it's really amazing can you maybe just tell us a little bit about the process how how did you write it did you have any help 
Um, how long did it take? All these things. It's a pretty chunky book as well. Yes. So I wanted to get my book out as quick as possible. And as you know, I was doing the chef course and a million other things at the same time. And I'm not the most, what's the word? I couldn't have put this together by myself. This is my story and all my wisdom, but I had a professional person help me put the structure together. So I work really closely with her on a daily basis, pouring my heart out, my story and all the wisdom that I wanted to share. And then she would make sure that it sounds right and it's spelt right and all that stuff. And she was honestly the most incredible lady that if I was to write another book, I would go to her. So I can give you her details. Um, and yeah, I decided to self-publish again because of the time that I wanted to get it out into the world. Of course, I would love this to eventually be backed by a publisher so I can get it more global. Um, but the reason I self-published was by the time that I finished writing the book, I could publish it like a week later. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I'd taken it to a publisher, it would have taken at least a year for it to come out. And I wasn't prepared to kind of wait that long. I just yeah. knew that I had to get something out as soon as possible. Um, so I decided to self-publish with Amazon. And it was a really easy process where I put it on there, waited a week, it got uploaded, like the script, and it's print on demand. So I don't have to have all my books sat in a oh, warehouse. Nice. Whenever someone orders it, it gets printed and sent. It's yeah, an amazing process. That is amazing. So, yeah. Yeah, I ordered my, my own straight away. I was like, oh my gosh, I need that. <laughs> yeah, um, that's so cool. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, that's what I did. Is there any other questions? No, how long did it take you like to, to write it back and forth with your ghostwriter? A year. A year, okay. So it yeah. was still a long process. Wow. Yeah, oh wait. No, no, no. So it, a year with me writing all my notes beforehand. So I already had everything. Mm. Like I'd put together loads of things, like a diary together. But then with her, I would say, um, let me see. Eight months. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Wow. And then you've also got a, you also got a journal, which is epic. Like, well done for getting that up because I think, you know, the book is brilliant, but like you said, journaling is, is the self help and that's actually where people yeah. probably get like the, um, the most benefit, you know, when they start writing things down for themselves. So was that almost the exact same process? Um, journal, it was a bit different. I did this with someone else that's a professional in journaling. So she helps loads of people create their own like PTs, you know, whatever mm. is specialist to that person. So I went to her and this, I'd always dreamt of making like forever because I journal all the time. And I have my own way of doing it. Um, so it was a bit of a similar process, but it was much quicker. We literally sat down with this amazing lady and literally in a day went through what I want on every single page. And she went away and we used this thing called Trello. She mm. uploaded it all because she did like the graphics, um, checked it was with our, like in my kind of like branding and within the space of a couple of months, it was ready. Wow. Cool. Yeah, I think because <laughs> I was, I really knew what I wanted, made it easier. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was really quick, really quick. And wow. if anything, I was like, oh my gosh, what are you doing to me? Like you're going like a million miles an hour. But I knew again, it would really help people. I don't. Did I send you one, Gara? No, 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 you didn't. Oh, I'll have to <laughs> send you one. I'll send you one. But it's got like cool things like morning and evening um, reflections and weekly yeah. activities, weekly affirmations. Like, yeah. Brilliant so idea. Powerful. Well done. Yeah. Thank you. And how cool when it flows like that, when you're in that flow state and, it's, and things are, the resistance is low and what have you. It must be a great feeling to have it flow like that and you must know that you're on like a good wicket or on a good path that when it goes like that, you know? Yeah. And I think the more people message and tell me what they need or what they, yeah, what they want, like what they're struggling with, I kind of think, Oh my gosh, then they should have this. And that's where all yeah. the product ideas come from. And I just yeah. like run ahead with it <laughs> while yeah. I can. So sure. yeah. Could you maybe tell us more about your hope principle? Yes, yeah, so um, hope principles came from, firstly, I want to inspire hope. And I thought it was the best way that you can remember all the principles within them. 
Um, these principles I've been following since that hospital event, but I always had them on like a tiny piece of paper and would check them off. Um, so HOPE stands for home and under home there is your home environment, so where you live and what the weather's like, the climate's like. Um, then there's decluttering because I believe that a clutter-free house means a clutter-free mind, clear mind, clear skin. Ah, sleep. There we go. Exactly. That's very <laughs> important. And you know what? I sometimes think why have I put it under H because it's easily forgotten and it's so, 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 so important because when you sleep, that is when you really heal. Mm. And as X-Men warriors, we struggle with the sleeping aspect. So that is a huge element. Um, and then under O, which is for optimism, that is the visualization. So I talk about like creating vision boards. So I always have one for every year. Um, affirmations, um, journaling, gratitude journaling, and meditation. Cool. Nice. And then under P, there is two Ps, one for purpose. So finding a purpose in your everyday life. So that can be in your career or it can be in your home life. Everyone's purpose is different and not everyone knows what their purpose is and that's okay. It's just trying to find meaning and fulfillment in your life. Mm -hmm. um, and then pampering, I talk about using natural products and all the products that can help you, you know, feel pampered and turn like the cream situation into like a pampering session rather than feeling like, oh, poor me, I have to use all these creams. Mm -hmm. um, turn it into so like smart. a more luxury thing, yeah. yeah. And then E stands for ecotherapy. So as you guys know, I love to be out in nature and I feel like nature really brings you back to your true self. Um, exercise, motion creates positive emotion and eating well. So I talk about eating well, eating nutritious, but eating balanced and not being obsessive. Um, mm. And then to wrap up the hope principles, there is S and that stands for stress management and support. Cool stuff. Yeah. Those are all great tools yeah, for really people to cope with eczema, but also life in general. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think, wow, if we all just, you know, simplified things and we did the those things you know rather than thinking you need this and that and that and whatever to to be healthy and to live yeah. a fulfilling life then yeah to just be a, a hell of a lot easier <laughs> exactly exactly yeah and and like um before we we finish off like you know you've you've talked you've spoken about the secrets um i also know there's another book which uh you've uh read and has inspired you but are there any other readings or things that you know you recommend that have helped you in your journey oh, so many I put them in the back of my book um loads of different ones like it depends what mood I'm in um like the anxiety solution by Chloe Brotheridge really helped me because I think you know you can get anxiety living with eczema that really helped um gosh there was Louise Hay. I remember you mentioning her that was a big yes. one wasn't it? heal your heal your life that big. was the that was the, yeah, the first book I ever read that made me realize that my skin could be more something internal than it is physical. And I didn't quite believe it until I had that experience where I went into hospital. And now when I do have something wrong with my health, I do turn to her book and think, okay, what's the spiritual meaning behind this? And I'm like, oh gosh, that's so true because I'm struggling with that. Um, and eczema is breathtaking antagonism and mental eruptions mm -hmm. and that for me fits so perfectly because whenever I'm feeling like stressed and my mind's blown the eczema comes up so yeah yeah that's cool that actually I would yeah. I've actually got that book here um and I bought it after we had um two other girls on our podcast the Merrymaker sisters mm -hmm. uh, they're they they uh, girls at Craig met in Australia and they like doing amazingly well but and um, they were also like in a sort of confused and, and difficult part of their life. And that was a book for them, which also changed their life. So she's obviously like a great lady. Um, yeah. It can be yeah. a bit confronting though, some of the stuff in the book, because if you say you have a some other symptom and then you read and you, you know, if you take it at face value, obviously then, then you're like, okay, well clearly that's an issue in my life and I need to, yeah, I need to clearly work on this, even though you might not feel like, it's an issue you know <laughs> yeah yeah it definitely it makes you think you're like really yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> cool and uh, so Camille what what does the future hold for such a bright young woman that is doing so many amazing things and what are you currently 
uh, working on or what are you working on? And also maybe just after that, you can just let our listeners know uh, where they can contact you and, uh, and get some of your wisdom. Um, so I'm just trying to like spread my message again, like as any, in many different ways as I can, hence wanting to go on podcasts. So I'm going to continue doing that, sharing my YouTubes, my blog, and just trying to spread the message as much as I can in any way I can. I'd like to eventually do like a speaking event. Um, and anyone that wants to like book me as a speaker, I'm here. Um, <laughs> and I am working on an online program. So it's going to be like the interactive version of my book. Um, just to for people that want to like really like see me talk through what I've mentioned in my book. Mm. And, and it's more like a teaching Um yeah so online interactive program i'm working on and in the pipeline which is like my little baby i'm working on natural skincare cream for eczema cool. warriors cool so yeah. that won't be out for a while because that takes a long time to create but it's gonna be like all the hope principles in a bottle so, <laughs> well hopefully Lovely. as much as i can <laughs> yeah so really excited about that um, yeah just yeah, taking each day as it comes, spreading positivity and trying to talk and reach as many people as possible. And yeah. people can find me by going on my Instagram, typing in Camille Knowles, Facebook Camille Wellness. Um, but if they want to um, learn about the hope principles, like in short, without getting the book, they can join my tribe at www.thebeautyofexima.com slash join. And once they've joined the tribe, I send them a series of emails with videos explaining what h-o-p-e-s stand for and then i send weekly positive uplifting newsletters that don't go to anybody else but just my tribe so, yeah. that's cool and uh, i'm i'm definitely uh, subscribed to your tribe and i get to your <laughs> weekly emails and i love them they're very funny and you know full of great positive things um so yeah well done um and and just before we finish off uh, we always ask um, our guests a question um so we just like to know like what does being ridiculously human mean to you um knowing that you are limitless and anything that you put that you believe in your mind you can create in your reality and that is we are all ridiculously human and as as long as we believe that then we can make our reality beautiful yeah. Boom, Perfect. well done. <laughs> um, so Camille, yeah. Yeah, just briefly from my side, I'll, I'll just start off re real briefly. Just thank you so much for today. Just a real epic chat. You, you're such, an, like I said, such a bubbly, happy person, but you've been through so much and you, you're still bringing that, that positivity, that, that positive spin on, on tough situations. And we, we seriously, the world needs more of that. So um, continue spreading your good message. Um, I think it's, uh, as we mentioned earlier, it's, it's more than just eczema. I think eczema is a really important thing, but I think all of us can just do with more of your hope principles and um, more of your positivity in life. So, um, you know, I'm looking forward to the stuff that you're going to be doing in the future because you're bringing a great message. So from my side, just thank you so much uh, for uh, sharing your wisdom with us today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's really nice to meet you, Craig. Thank you. Cool. And uh, Camille, from me, I, I just want to say, like, I've, I've always been a fan. And like now, after listening to your story in, you know, on the podcast here and reading your book, like I'm even a bigger fan. And um, what you've gone through is really uh, tough. It's traumatic. It's devastating. It, it, it's, it's difficult. Um, but that whole time there's been something in you. There's been this like fire and this determination and this courage to overcome it. And you, you're an extremely strong lady for doing that. Um, and, and I commend you so much for that. And, and it, it's, it's truly inspirational. Um, you, you really, you know, you, you spread a great message. I, I love the hope principle. I love bringing joy and, um, what you've created is amazing. So just seriously, thank you so much. You, you speak really well. You articulate your message very well. And, you know, like you said, those speaking gigs and that, that you want to do, you're going to be really awesome at it. I have no doubt about that. And yeah, just keep doing great work. And thanks so much for 
being so open and honest and vulnerable with us uh, on this podcast, it really means a lot to Craig and I. And I think it means a lot to people in general because it gives them permission to also be vulnerable and, and share their stories too. So thank you so much. It's really been an amazing chat. Thank you so much. You guys can make me emotional. <laughs> thank you. It's, it's a privilege to be on here. Thank you for putting me on the Ridiculously Human podcast. I feel so privileged to be great. here. Thank you. Cool. cool. Thank Man, you. That was epic. <laughs> Thanks, cool. Will. That was great. Thank yeah, you. that was so good. So yeah, so awesome. Thank you so much. It was Thanks such a great chat. We had a great yeah. chat. Really appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. You're and, have a great and, morning. Yeah. Let me know when you're in London again. It'll be good to catch up and. Yeah, yeah. I will do. Well, my yeah. sister's living there now, so yeah, okay, cool. I will. Awesome. Or even on the Gold Coast, where you want yeah. to get some weather. <laughs> I do. <Yeah. laughs> if I can get that, I will do. <laughs> cool. Right, cool. Take care of yourself. All right. Have a bye great bye. weekend, day. Thanks. See you later. Yeah. Bye. Cheers. Bye. 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 Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour, and up in the air. Stop at the toll, digging for change, snowy.